but the book itself presents studies from all over the world. The book is an example of comparative archaeology or, or world history. At the conference, we debated the proposition that ancient cities and city-states city uh, were integrated by rulers or religious leaders, and they were stable. Furthermore, in the traditional view, the collapse of these states only happened when bad things occurred. There was climate change or invaders defeated uh, otherwise stable uh, states. Uh, our conference showed to the contrary that in many instances, early states were not at all stable and were only weakly integrated and that governments were internally resisted and political orders became undone from that resistance. Early states in these instances thus were fragile. There are some chapters in the book on Egypt, for example, and on Harappan city-states, both of which were long, long lived. However, there were still struggles of governments to overcome structural problems in those states as well. The Egypt chapter is called The Art of Not Collapsing. So fragility could be defied as well as yield to the forces of resistance. I'm going to start this talk with a brief look at Mesopotamia, and then I'm going to turn for um, some very brief looks at other examples before returning to Mesopotamia for further, for further discussion. Here's a geographical look at some of the areas I'm going to be discussing later after my, my tour of the horizon. You, you all will be very familiar with all this territory, so I needn't belabor what will be obvious to you. These are the Zagros Mountains, essentially between Iran and Iraq. I'm going to focus on the old Babylonian examples in, in the talk, the time period from about 2000 to 1600 BC. And this was the time when a people called Kassites from the Zagros um, achieved power in Mesopotamia. But the questions are, why did they come to Mesopotamia and how did they achieve power? The very south of Mesopotamia was the sea land in Mesopotamian terms, in texts, um, and it was the home of a dynasty, the sea land dynasty, which held power in the last days of the dynasty of Hammurabi of Babylon. I'm going to divert from the old Babylonian period in one instance to show something of the evolution of cities in Mesopotamia, in this case Uruk, the first city in southern Mesopotamia, because I want to talk about the consequences of demographic change in the evolution of cities, and I want to illustrate that not only in Mesopotamia but in comparative perspective. Here's Babylon, of course, the capital of the Hammurabi dynasty, on which I will be spending some time. I'm not going to go as far as Ashur today, but um, you all will know about the old Assyrian trading system, the connections between the city-state of Ashur in the old Assyrian period with um, Anatolian cities, uh, especially uh, Kultep at Kanesh. A key text from Mesopotamia about resistance to power is called the uh, Epic of Atrahasis. And I want to read a, a section of this poem from uh, the start of the poem. When the gods instead of man did the work, bore the loads, <clears throat> 
the work was too hard, the trouble too much. The great gods made the lesser gods bear the workload, dig the channels of the Tigris and Euphrates. The lesser gods groaned and decided to confront the great gods. They set fire to their tools at night and surrounded the temple of the highest god. My lord, the chamberlain said to the god Enlil, the highest god, a rabble is surrounding your door. This is not a photo of the Mesopotamian gods. It's a torchlight procession from colonial India. The high gods took counsel and decided to create men to do the work of the lesser gods. We must ask the question, where did this story of revolt come from? What in real life could have inspired this poem and this kind of scene of rebellion? Oops. Okay, I'm... okay, sorry. We know that there were many rebellions, in fact, in Mesopotamia. The sons of Sargon of Akkade were assassinated. And there was a great revolt against the grandson of Sargon, Naram Sin, who put down the revolt. And there are so-called city laments in which the gods, literary texts in which the gods destroyed cities for reasons uh, best known to themselves. I'm going to discuss in more detail the uh, rebellions under uh, the kings of the old Babylonian dynasty later, but I couldn't resist also adding a slightly later instance of rebellion when the king of Assyria, Tukulti Ninurta I, um, uh, uh, was assassinated by his nobles, resulting in uh, the decentralization of the Assyrian state. Well, that's, that's enough Mesopotamia for right now. I'll come back to it later but I wanted to uh, be a bit of a tour guide uh, in some other cases of rebellion and collapse of ancient states around the world. I'm going to talk about Teotihuacan. I'll show you some maps and some scenes later. So this is just a name guide. Teotihuacan in central southern Mexico. Cahokia in Middle West North America, Shang, China in the second millennium BC. I'm going to have very brief words about Aztecs and Inca, all examples of collapse and fragility. And I'm going to show you some scenes from Chaco Canyon. It's in the southwest of um, North America, the US. Um, it's about uh, four hours drive for where I'm presently sitting. But let me return to Mesopotamia for just one moment before moving on, since I wanted to show you a slide that is familiar to, uh, to you probably from the work of Robert Adams. It's about the evolution of the first city in southern Mesopotamia, Uruk. This evolution occurred <coughs> in the fourth millennium BC, at the mid and late fourth millennium, and it was a geographic change. It was a demographic change, sorry, not one of population growth that resulted in the appearance of Uruk. So you can see that there are many cities in the uppermost portion of the uh, slide and then the practical disappearance of these vi the villages rather in lots of villages 
and Uruk at the bottom part of the, I think I can use this. Yeah, there's Uruk. Um, and then these villages essentially uh, are reduced in number as Uruk and other cities as well um, develop. There are consequences of this. You are all, I think, familiar with the series of great temples at Uruk itself. But also demographically, the city itself became a new home to diverse peoples, new kinds of organizations, new divisions of labor, new ideas about kingship and social hierarchy with this attendant on this demographic change resulting in uh, the evolution of Uruk. Now here is Teotihuacan in south central uh, Mexico. It flourished from about 300 BC to AD 550. It's about this, this, the, the city of Teotihuacan is about 20 square kilometers in size and was inhabited by about 100,000 people. Here is the settlement pattern um, documenting the evolution of the city of Teotihuacan. Again, you can see in an earlier time period in the upper part of the slide, lots of villages and the same pr process of urbanization we saw in Uruk when these villages disappear. The countryside becomes depopulated. There are some differences in the uh, re reasons why this happened in Teotihuacan and Uruk, but the result is basically the same thing, at least for my purposes today. There was a new kind of government that, devolved, that developed at uh, Teotihuacan and a very diverse population of people who were brought into um, into uh, the, the, the city, which we can document very clearly from the various neighborhoods in Teotihuacan with distinctive ceramics that are characteristic of regions not in Teotihuacan itself originally. Here is a plan of the site with the central part, the Street of the Dead, La Calle de los Muertos, in the center. Note the scale bar, one kilometer. This is an enormous place. There is nothing like it anywhere near it in Mesoamerica. Here's a photo of the part of the Street of the Dead, which contains several pyramids. We're looking from one of them um, at the head of the street toward another one, and there are many large buildings and um, uh, uh, ceremonial plazas. Now, for this talk, it's important to know for my purposes that Teotihuacan ceremonial district was burned at about 550 AD. However, the rest of the city, the neighborhoods were not burned. Only the ceremonial center was. What happened? Teotihuacan had no enemy anywhere near it that could have defeated it and burned down this ceremonial district. The argument by by specialists is that this burning was an inside job. There was a rebellion, internal resistance to the rulers of the city. Now I take you to the center of the U.S. Uh, and the site of Cahokia. Note the dates of the site, 1050 to 1275. Cahokia developed in a what one investigator calls a big bang. At 1040, there was almost nothing there. At 1050, a huge city emerged. But it only lasted a little more than 200 years. 
although we don't have the kind of survey data that we have for Uruk and Teotihuacan, the population from Cahokia, again, came from all over the countryside near it, as various material culture studies show. Here's an illustration of the uh, central part of Cahokia, an artist drawing on the left, and a photo of the main mound called Monk's Mound in the center. This is the grandest site in all of North America. And it includes one other large center uh, 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 about 20 kilometers away, but part of the same Cahokia complex. Uh, this is in St. Louis, Missouri, across the Mississippi River. And this huge mound was torn down uh, around uh, in, uh, 1870. The entire site complex's estimated population is 20,000 people. But remember, it didn't last very long from its inception almost overnight at 1050 to it becoming an urban site, and then it was utterly abandoned. I'm now moving you on this guided tour to China and to talk about the earliest cities in China in the second millennium BC. Actually, Chinese archaeology is moving very quickly, and there are cities earlier than these three cities, which are the subjects of ongoing excavations now. The size of these early cities in China is enormous. Here's the first one of them in the Shang Dynasty, Arlito. Notice the scale here is 200 meters. And I'm only interested in simply uh, uh, telling you the story now of how brief these huge cities were in their existence. Here is the next one around, Zhengzhou. It's flourished for less than 200 years. And these are the city walls of Zhengzhou that exist today in the middle of this modern uh, modestly sized provincial city in China of about 10 million people. And finally, here is Anyang, the th third city and the last one in the Shang Dynasty period in China. This is a, a scale bar of a thousand meters. There are um, palatial areas, royal cemeteries, craft workshops um, as part of the city, which was the largest city in the world at 1200 BC. The excavators estimate the size of this complex as 30 square kilometers and with a population of more than 200,000 people. The kings at Anyang were extremely powerful. They conquered much territory, but the king had to campaign every single year um, in order to hold that territory. And the, this mighty urban complex lasted only a very short time. I only want to show you the size of the Aztec Empire in Mesoamerica and the Inca Empire in Peru. Both of them lasted around 150 years. And it's often said, well, they, they fell because Spanish came in and conquered them with superior arms. But in fact, there were many enemies of the Aztecs and Incas and the Spanish found ready allies in their battles against uh, an empire which was vulnerable or in terms of this project, fragile. Lastly, I take you to the American Southwest and the site of Chaco Canyon. There is an unprecedented growth 
uh, in Chaco Canyon, starting from the most modest habitations in the ninth century AD. And the construction here is the canyon itself. And here is Pueblo Benito, one of 12 great houses uh, that were built extremely rapidly in this time period. Here's another one just up the course of almost as large as Pueblo Benito. There was nothing like Chaco Canyon before it appeared, and there was nothing like Chaco after it. These great houses, here's an overhead view of Pueblo Benito, um, were not habitation. They are, there is no domestic facilities, no hearths in Chaco. It was a ceremonial site, um, a place of rituals. And there are roads connecting Chaco Canyon to all over the area in the southwest. And pilgrims came to Chaco uh, in the summer to celebrate rites of passage and curing. Um, initially, uh, Chaco uh, evolved importantly through its connections with far distant Mesoamerica and the Maya. One of the recent research campaigns at Chaco have shown that some distinctive drinking vessels found in Pueblo Benito had cacao, cocoa residue, which only occurs in Mesoamerica. So there was a connection as the Maya civilization, which I'm not going to talk about here, was collapsing, that there were traders bringing exotic goods with ritual significance to the American Southwest more than a thousand kilometers away. Long distance trade uh, was definitely occurring. Now it's important for my story that Chaco, when it was abandoned, not only lost its population, but lost its religion. And a new religion was invented. These are dolls representing masked figures, which uh, appear only after the fall and abandonment of Chaco. A new belief system arose in which the gods uh, were thought to have abandoned Chaco because of its, um, uh, its uh, un-Pueblo-like, at least in terms of modern oral histories, um, uh, hierarchical systems. Now, bound up in all this, there was a huge drought of over 75 years. But if your religion is very importantly predicated on making it rain in the arid Southwest, and it doesn't rain for 75 years, you need a new religion. And this religion of Kachinas here marching in a historic photograph, those dolls represent these supernatural beings. This religion exists uh, through today in modern Indian Pueblos in the American Southwest. Okay, enough of my guided tour through uh, the, a world of fragilities. I return to Mesopotamia <clears throat> and want to present a little more detailed case of resistance and rebellion. I can only outline the data, so I'll just tell this uh, Mesopotamian case of fragility as a story. After the collapse of the very centralized state of the third dynasty of Ur around 2000 BC, there was a competition of city-states in the old Babylonian uh, period, which dates to uh, from roughly 2000 to 1600 BC. It's called the Old Babylonian Period because a dynasty from Babylon uh, under uh, uh, King Hammurabi conquered the entirety of Middle and Southern Mesopotamia. So here is the stela of the Code of Hammurabi. It's uh, the Code of Hammurabi is uh, neither the first law code in Mesopotamia 
uh, nor even a real code of laws. In hundreds of legal cases in this period, there is never a reference to the Code of Hammurabi. And there are instances when legal cases settled in courts were uh, decided precisely against what is declared in the Code of Hammurabi. So for very brief examples, women are prevented from initiating divorce in the Code of Hammurabi. If they do, they'll be thrown from a tower. But in fact, we have many instances of women divorcing their husbands. In Hammurabi, it is said, if a thief is caught, he shall be killed. We have many documents in which thieves are caught and the owners want their money back. Here's a detail from the top of that stila showing Hammurabi paying obeisance to the God of justice. Hammurabi promises to rebuild the main temples in the cities that he had conquered and destroyed while he taxed the provinces brutally after his conquest. <clears throat> if we have to choose a single word to describe Hammurabi, he was a tyrant. There was a perfect storm of resistance to Hammurabi and his son and successor. The empire of Hammurabi lasted under his own reign five years. His conquests were completed around 755 and Hammurabi died in 1750. The revolts of the Babylonian cities conquered by Hammurabi began in the eighth year of his son and successor, 1742. And at this time, the kingdom of the Sealand in the southernmost marshes of Mesopotamia uh, became evident. The uh, southern uh, princes established their own kingdom in the last days of the uh, rulers of the Hammurabi dynasty. And Kassites, mercenaries uh, under various rulers of old Babylonian cities, um, finally uh, 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 got power over all of Mesopotamia. But initially, they just established armed encampments in the Babylonian countryside. There were also trouble in cities. Temples became lending institutions and local mayors took over power in cities under the last Babylonian kings. I'll say more about these uh, processes later. Finally, there was a Hittite raid on Babylon. History books like to say the Hittites came down as a bolt from the blue. Mesopotamian historians are usually not very poetic, so this is their attempt. But in fact, as we uh, can see, they didn't defeat a mighty Babylonian state. The Babylonian state was essentially uh, undone from within. Let me summarize all of that. Um, City-states were conquered by Hammurabi in the last years of his reign, and rebellion started almost immediately in the eighth year of his son in the south. So the great empire of Hammurabi uh, lasted 13 years. Here's a reminder of how we know about much of the story I'm telling you. Uh, from clay tablets. This one is in Istanbul, in fact. We have lots of private contracts, court cases, economic transactions of all sort in the period of Hammurabi. And we can trace what was going on, um, not from royal inscriptions, but from these kinds of documents. Let me go back now to give you a, a view of the geography of resistance in Mesopotamia. Here is a view of the south. Uh, you can see why it might be called in Mesopotamian texts themselves, uh, the sea land. 
And there have been many new tablets published in very recent years um, documenting um, this Sealand dynasty and its control of the southmost part of Babylonia. Kassites come from the Zagros Mountains. Kassite is uh, linguistically an isolate. And today in the Zagros Mountains, there are still many languages which are linguistic isolates, not Semitic, not Indo-European uh, in this region. Initially, Kassites were mercenaries hired by Babylonian kings um, to fight their battles. And Kassites uh, were thus attracted to the wealth of Babylonian cities and established armed, their own armed encampments in the countryside in the time after um, Hammurabi. There were rebellions in Mesopotamian cities as well. It, Bab Babylonian tablets show that the palace needed to hire laborers to work on its various projects and required permissions of mayors of cities uh, to be able to hire local inhabitants. Also, the Babylonian crown became itself a credit institution. It loaned silver and grain, but it had a cash flow problem and sometimes had to call in these loans early and sacrifice interest. And we read in Babylonian tablets about the powers of assemblies and councils in, um, in Babylonian cities. The Babylonian temple loans are especially interesting. They make these loans to sick people, and they specify that when the sick people are cured, they must pay back the temple at high interest rates. It's a legal fiction. Temples also have cash flow problems and invent a new way to loan money. The Hittite attack on Babyl Babylonia and Babylon itself uh, came suddenly, of course, but it was not uh, as if the Babylonian state was very stable and uh, was defeated by a very powerful foreign expeditionary force. Let me try now to pull all of this together. Here is a kind of master narrative of uh, complexity and fragility in early cities and states. The traditional account is to think of uh, ancient states as once evolved as very stable and uh, long lasting. They were integrated in scare quotes around integrated by brutal despotic tyrants. We have all the Greek um, uh, uh, literature on how their enemies, the Persians, were uh, Orientals. They were tyrants and despots. They were not subject to any kind of control by their own citizens. Um, uh, uh, one historian calls this view of uh, of uh, West, West Asian states, Occidentalism. Uh, the citizens had no power and they were completely uh, controlled by despotic kings. In one history book, the author declares that Mesopotamian states were not ramshackle, that is, they were not fragile. And the master narrative holds that collapse of these states happen when there's a climate change, either exogenous um, or they were created by, uh, by people themselves. You probably know uh, the books of Jared Diamond on, on collapse that uh, buys that kind of master narrative. And this master narrative ignores the fragility that I've been trying to point to of ancient cities and states them, them, themselves, many of which 
lasted only for a short time and they were very effectively resisted by their own populations. Why is there fragility? Well, on the one hand, we have seen that the evolution of many cities was very rapid, and this holds around the world. It was not a gradual process where you had some sites that were small and got a lot large, little larger and then a little larger, and finally there was a city. These cities emerged often extremely rapidly. And they resulted in new kinds of rulers and new kinds of power. Um, these rulers were glorified in ancient texts and in the constructions, temples and palaces that, um, that we see and which required teams of unfree laborers to, to build. There were also new kinds of social organizations in cities. The new kinds of massive population densities resulted in new sorts of problems that required new sorts of controls by rulers, which did not always succeed. Here again is just that slide reminding you of the very rapid evolution of, uh, of Uruk. Now, um, after this period, I'm not showing you further um, scenes of, uh, of demographic changes, but villages, again, uh, became characteristic in the countryside. But these were not like the older, more or less independent villages. The new villages were tied to, to cities. And I can't resist a slide showing uh, an artist's conception of temples in uh, Uruk, which emerged so rapidly at the end of the um, uh, fourth millennium. So much for my critique of gradualist scenarios in which kings were all powerful and could do anything they wanted and that bad things only happened as a result of climate change or or invaders. Perhaps we can see some of these early states um, as ironies. The more integration the, uh, uh, they were, the more centralized these states, and I'm speaking of Mesopotamia and also my tour of uh, early states around the world, the more resistance, the, uh, the more integrated they were, the more resistance there was to them. The vulnerabilities were external and internal both. And there were, of course, adjustments and accommodations in those states that lasted a relatively long time. Um, uh, the Egypt chapter in this fragility volume is entitled, The Art of Not Collapsing. It didn't mean there weren't problems, but it means that rulers could also deal with those problems. In some instances, Egypt is a classic example. Henry Wright called early cities experiments, and I think there's a lot to that. I've shown you that throughout the world, many early of the earliest cities lasted only for a very short time. So what is the case for fragility? First of all, I'm not trying to present you with a new law or a new rule. There are many kinds of ancient states and cities and many kinds of, uh, of, of fragility. So fragility is simply a point of entry into investigating the structure of early cities and states. Now there is unfinished business in this story. It has occurred to me while thinking about Mesopotamian fragility that there was practically no period in Mesopotamia when war was not 
endemic. And it seems to me that even with many studies of Mesopotamian warfare, that there are some issues that have not been explored. First, migration to Mesopotamia by Kassites and other named people were in part stimulated by the need of Mesopotamian rulers to enlist mercenaries and soldiers that could not be supplied by local populations. In a recent article, Guillermo Algaze argued that um, in cities, disease must have been present and that people were attracted to cities from outside because so many people were dying in disease-ridden cities. But I think that there's, that may, it's, it's, it's hard, that's a case that's hard to show as Algaze uh, admits. But I think we do have good evidence that kings recruited people from outside to come into cities in some part because of the need to find new uh, soldiers. Second, what are the implications of warfare for farmers who had to serve in armies? We know that citizens of Mesopotamia were recruited and wealthy citizens could hire substitutes for them in, uh, as they were being recruited by, by kings. But what happened to agriculture, farming, when soldiers in cities uh, recruited to go to war? What happened to uh, farming? But beyond these specifics, there has been a larger problem uh, as scholars um, have in some instances failed to think of the past as truly real, as the poet T.S. Eliot put it. So I want to conclude my story with an anecdote to illustrate what I mean by that. Some years ago, a very great French scholar gave a paper the flight of slaves, a major problem for the palace at Mari. It seems that by studying palace archives, one can become an apologist for the palace, even a royalist. His paper could and perhaps should have been entitled Opportunities for Freedom by Slaves at Mari. So the moral of my talk is that one may see more clearly the nature of a society by examining it when it is in trouble, on the verge of collapse, and then asking why the society was so fragile. Also, a comparative perspective on fragility allows us to escape the myopia of texts or specific sites, and the consequent myopia of scholars too embedded in their own texts and sites to ask new questions. Thank you, Joke Mercy. Thank you very much for your talk, which uh, by some side uh, sometimes sounds very modern, actually. <laughs> uh, maybe could you stop sharing your screen that we can see all of us, each other? Thank you. So now let us uh, go to uh, questions or comment. Uh, yes, Marie Ariette, I see Marie Ariette. <laughs> you should, you, you didn't? No, yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this remarkable and somewhat uh, depressing talk, if I may <laughs> say so. Uh, do you? consider that it is only in antiquity that states are fragile? No. Um, I've written about uh, collapse in various respects for, for a fairly long time, and uh, I am uh, not uh, unusually invited to, uh, to comment uh, whether what I 
think is happening in the past uh, has any relevance for, for modern politics and modern societies. And I try very hard to avoid such questions since I'm trying hard to understand the past itself uh, rather than to uh, use it as a platform for modern political commentary. But I'm certainly not averse to uh, having all sorts of people think about such a situation. And indeed, the term fragility is appearing very, very commonly now in all sorts of contexts about um, present political uh, conditions and present societal institutions. So uh, I'm sorry uh, not to uh, make some pronouncement about how what I have learned about the past should be implemented in present political uh, decisions. Um, but uh, I'm not going to prevent you from thinking about that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that uh, Thomas, you had a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Norman, for this for this fascinating talk. Uh, the timing could not have been better, since I'm currently teaching a seminar on on crisis and response and resilience in pre and early historic societies. I see also my graduate students here, which I'm very happy about. Uh, in, the, in the previous week, we're focusing a bit on this notorious 4.2K phenomenon and uh, of course the gospel that uh, Harvey Weiss is preaching that this is the sole reason for the collapse of the Akkadian Empire. Um, there's this interesting uh, alternative view which was published a couple of years ago by the two Catherines, by, by right. Catherine and Catherine Kusujiolu, and right. also this nice article by, by your colleague, by um, Meyer, um, collapse, collapse of what? <laughs> so my question is how do you, well, when you talk about collapse, the question is how, how this is perceived by, by the communities or, or the, we're living in a, in a state-like system in a particular period, because we are just pinpointing these, these showcase sites and see that there's something happening there and some overturns and revolution. But what about the other populations? What about the other people? Did they even notice that, that something changed in there? in their private in their in their daily and monthly and yearly uh, routines so how would you how would you define this this collapse issue <laughs> or command on it to what degree this is really something that is then perceived by by the community at large in a specific region like also anatolia when the uh, when chupiluluma the second just <laughs> went into hiding right and how how was this really reflected then by, by, by the communities at large, wherever they were settling. <laughs> well, um, some years ago, uh, I was invited um, to participate in a, a two-person panel at Ohio State University, mm -hmm. where um, uh, exists the leading uh, laboratory for research on um, climate change through uh, ice corings in mm. the poles and in various glaciers. Mm. And I was paired with an environmental scientist, indeed uh, a man who works with Harvey Weiss and has been to Leylan, um, to discuss precisely the effects of climate change in this period. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Menokal, de Menokal, the uh, climate scientist, um, detailed his his various um, uh, scientific re report research on on climate change, um, which clearly happened. And then I got up to say that indeed uh, I was not interested in challenging any of the scientific evidence of climate change but wanted to point out that the cultural responses to climate change um, uh, uh, could vary considerably. So in the Mesopotamian instance that you cite with the fall of Akkadi, there have been lots of historical studies um, uh, which were pioneered by a scholar called Glasner, 
uh, about the fall of Akade uh, for various internal reasons. Um, and uh, be that as it may, in the period after Akade, we have an unbroken textual record from the side of Lagash of a series of kings in which uh, there's no evidence whatsoever of some Amorite invasion from the north in the period. So uh, the dynasty goes on quite peacefully, even though there was climate change. And in the book you cited by the two Katrins, mm -hmm. um, they show that climate change was uh, by, by and large localized and where you could get climate, severe climate change in one place 50 kilometers away, uh, it was not clear that climate change was a, a serious factor in, factor in, what was, in what was going on at all. Yeah, exactly. So and when you talk about collapse, you must break down the term um, to see what it was that was collapsing. And of course, political dynasties uh, collapse fairly frequently. But the question is, does a culture collapse? And I gave you one example today of cultural collapse, that Chaco Canyon example, when not only was a site abandoned, but the belief system mm -hmm. present in that site mm -hmm. utterly changed throughout its region of, of, of influence. So that is a collapse on two variables, one, the political variable, but, uh, and that's not abnormal because we talk about dynasties collapsing all the time. Right, but the right. collapse of a rich cultural tradition, uh, that is a rare instance. And we have instances of mm -hmm. that. Um, so collapse in this sense, uh, we, we need to say exactly what it is that is uh, collapsing. And a collapse in one sphere need not uh, entail a collapse in another. Okay. Thank you very much. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Elliot uh, Larry. No? Yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting, thought-provoking about uh, the, the place of uh, fragility. And I particularly liked the, the fact that you mentioned that sometimes uh, when one is do, uh, doing uh, ancient studies, one can risk becoming an apologist for mm. previous dynasties because, uh, for instance, I'm studying um, the old Assyrian period with uh, the merchants and all that stuff. And I would say that the main advantage uh, with the period is that the state is quite silent, I would say, because we do not have a, a lot of archive on it. So we have a different perspective, but with all these... Uh, kings and rulers, we often tend to be fascinated by them, even though the, most of the texts are often uh, modified for propaganda and self-promotion uh, reasons. So you, you mentioned at one point, uh, sure, and I would like to know uh, what uh, was your opinion uh, on this part of uh, this history? Well, con congratulations for uh, studying uh, the old Assyrian period. It's one of the most fascinating. And it raises an interesting question uh, of uh, sampling in historical perspective. So as you know, we have 20,000 plus texts from, from Kanesh and from other sites as, as well, but almost all of which report on merchant activities. Um, now we know that there is a palace at Ashur, and we know that there are temples at Ashur, but we know almost nothing about them. So if we take this question of sample, it's not that the palace was not important or the temple was, was not important, it certainly was, but we don't have very much documentation to show exactly what was going on. If you go back a few hundred years to uh, they say the Ur three period, we have 100,000 or more documents referring to almost entirely um, activities uh, about palaces and bureaucratic systems. And we have very little information about trade. 
for example. Although we know trade existed, we have material evidence of foreign goods, clearly, and we do have uh, in some texts as well referring to temples and palaces funding trading um, expeditions. But we don't know a great deal about trade, and we certainly don't know that there were guilds of traders and private families entrepreneurially moving goods, as we know very clearly from the old Assyrian texts. So we must clearly see that the absence of information about trade and about guilds of traders and entrepreneurial behavior, the absence of that information in the Ur III period or earlier, uh, does not mean that such behavior didn't exist. And there, there's a fascinating relatively new book by a guy called Toby Wilkinson uh, uh, called Tying the Threads of Eurasia or something like that, where he shows clearly the long distance movement of goods from the middle of the fourth millennium BC from essentially the borders of China to the Mediterranean. And he traces this long distance movement of goods for the next four millennia. What he doesn't have much of, but synological archaeologists do, is a, 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 a parallel movement of goods from these Central Asian regions, and perhaps further to the West as well, to the China Sea, borders of China. So there is a continental movement. Who do you want to send it to? Uh, sorry. There's a continental movement of goods. Um, uh, uh, Who do you in, want to send it to? In very early periods. Uh, I don't see early periods in your contacts. Who do you want to send it to? <laughs> Sorry, uh, my iPad is trying to interrupt. Um, uh, so it's not hard, I think, uh, and some old Assyrian scholars, Goiko Baryanovich, for example, have speculated that old Assyrian systems of trade were probably not limited to the old Assyrian period, but to much earlier periods in Mesopotamia as well, uh, except we don't have good uh, historical records like we do from the remarkable records of the old Assyrian period. I'm sorry, did I drift off from your question? Who do you want to send it to? Enjoy. Any other question? Um, yes, uh, Charles? I have a question about um, the uh, existence of social hierarchy in all of these states. Uh, would you say that social hierarchy is an element for the creation of these cities, uh, but then it's also the, uh, uh, the, uh, it has in it the seeds of, the, of its own destruction? Is it like a two-edged sword, positive and negative? I very much like the way you put that. I, I think you, you, you say it well. Um, there were uh, social hierarchies before the evolution of Uruk and, and other cities, but they changed greatly uh, in this brand new appearance uh, we call urbanization. And um, whatever hierarchies there were before, some of them on the local level of community organization didn't disappear. We read of these local organizations, neighborhoods, local mayors, and so forth. But uh, the kind of interactions with the central state obviously were new. And they allowed uh, massive constructions, for example, uh, temples and palaces and city walls and and crafts work workmanship and so forth sponsored by temples and palaces but they at the same time uh, provided uh, leverage by these community organizations and people to resist demands of the central state as well so i like their image of the two-edged sword um, uh, as describing the process of, uh, of and and maintenance of urbanization I think Ilgi has a question. I do. 
I have a question, but first I have a, a, a silly comment. Uh, Professor Yoffi, whenever, if you use an iPad, if you say all the Syrian, Siri wakes up and tries to <laughs> respond. I've had this many times and I wanted to, to, uh, to know that Siri uh, thinks uh, somebody is talking to her. Anyway, I have a question. First of all, it was wonderful to hear you again, uh, to attend a lecture by you. and. Um, I, my question is not about Mesopotamia specifically, but in general about your research on fragility. I wonder whether um, your and your colleagues' research on fragility uh, also expands into, I know that you focus on early states, but also expands into um, less hierarchical or non-hierarchical societies than what kinds, of, uh, or whether um, the question on fragility in those societies are only about external or more environmental um, uh, causes. Uh, just in comparison, what has been found there? I'm just interesting, interested in that. Yeah, your, your, your question takes me beyond anything I know about uh, very much. But I have a colleague, she's called Deborah Martin, and she's a bioarchaeologist. She examines mortuary remains and human remains in various contexts. And she argues mainly in situation, it's a, she does worldwide studies, but, and, and she worked in the Emirates as well on some of Dan Potts's uh, tombs. But um, uh, she works in, uh, largely in, in North America. And she's been showing through uh, biomarkers on bones the amount of warfare and slavery and captivity in societies which are very far from being massively hierarchical. Um, so, uh, for example, she, um, she and her students have examined some a massacre or maybe more than one massacre sites, and we know there are in such sites in, in Anatolia as well, um, uh, uh, and, and shows that th there were shackles that left marks on the bones of people who were captured and uh, es essentially displayed, perhaps in, in ceremonies and processions before they were killed and thrown into pits. And in another one of her studies, and again, I'm very far from an authority on such things, there have been charges of cannibalism, for example, in the Southwest, um, uh, judging from uh, uh, cut marks, cuts on, on human bones. Um, and she argues that, and not only she, but she has, there, there are teams of people who work on these things, that these kind of cuts are representing what um, ancient uh, populations, ancient Indians did to witches. And there's accusations of witchcraft are very common in, in these societies and many societies, clearly. Um, and uh, such cut marks are not evidence of cannibalism at all, but of what uh, what people did to to to, to witches. So the, I'm not sure that is getting at what you want, but the amount of violence and if you don't call it war, you must call it conflict that existed uh, at all times, it seems, and in many places in the past. Warfare is something that happens when you have really stratified societies that can engage uh, lots, lots of people uh, to fight against uh, uh, enemies or simply to capture goods from distant places. Thank you. That was exactly the kind of lead I was looking for. <laughs> let, let me say that uh, if there are further questions um, or any issues that any of you might wish to further explore with me, I, I would be very, very happy to receive emails and to carry on conversations uh, uh, with you. Thank you. So now do we have uh, any other uh, question?
Well, I, I don't see any uh, comment. Well, so thank you very much, I mean, for this evening. I mean, Professor Yofi, I mean, you, you have a den in front of you. So thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone here, I mean, for a good uh, evening. So we are going to meet again on the uh, 11th of uh, April. It will be our archaeology, Bill Kent Archaeology Day. And then on the 9th of May, we shall have uh, Olga Pelaya, who is going to speak about the frescoes of uh, Macedonia. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Professor Yofi. And thank you. And a nice day. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you so much and great to see you again. <laughs> yeah, likewise.